Hello and welcome back to another episode of ESPC's First Timers Club. My name's Megan and today we're talking all about insurances. Now this might be something that you've not really considered in the process of buying your first home, but it is a really crucial step. So once you've had an offer accepted, it is time to start thinking about your insurances. So today I have got Paul DeMarco from ESPC Mortgages on to talk all about the insurances that you'll need to have in place um, ahead of moving into your first home. So without further ado, here's my chat with Paul. Okay, so Paul, uh, today we're going to be chatting all about insurances. Now that might be something that a lot of first time buyers haven't really thought about in mm. the start of their journey, but there are some insurances that you do need to have mm-hmm. if you own a property. And, and what are those? Well, the, the the one you must have is buildings insurance. It's compulsory to mm-hmm. have buildings insurance. Yeah. And I think it would be pretty crazy if you didn't have it anyway um that ensures all the building um now if you own a house mm-hmm. uh basically or an older flat flatted dwelling um you only need to obviously find your own buildings insurance which covers usually what's called the reinstatement value of the property it's a slightly different figure than the actual valuation mm-hmm. it's usually slightly lower depending on the actual property but buildings is definitely compulsory now, there are um, other uh, situations where the building's insurance is actually included in what's called a factor fee. So a factor fee is mainly for a kind of new build type flat. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't tend to have factor fees on houses, although there are the odd one. Um, but with flats, uh, basically, uh, they have a factor fee. You pay X amount of pounds per month. It doesn't just cover the building's insurance. It covers things like factoring of the building itself. And that is a block policy. So there's no need for the client to actually take that out because that's already included in the actual uh, factor fee itself, okay? Okay. Um, along with building's insurance, you would usually want to also add on contents insurance, which covers all the contents inside your house. Uh, the building insurance is obviously covering things like um, the structure of the building, the roof, you know, things like that. Whereas the contents are things like your sofa, your TV, your jewellery, your golf clubs, all that sort of stuff. You can also have uh, insurance for specific items like golf clubs, jewellery, um, laptops outside the house, which will cost you slightly extra. But building buildings insurance is compulsory. Contents is not, but combined together, it's definitely a good idea to be insured for both. And in terms of getting a mortgage, it's probably a good idea to get life insurance as well. Is that would would you say that that's yeah, yes about? and no. That depends on the, the the that depends on the individual person. Okay? okay. So so let me explain this to you. It's definitely still a good idea for everybody, I'd say. But some single uh, people who take a mortgage out on their own potentially don't want to have life cover for two reasons. One, uh, they're single, they don't have any dependents. Uh, If they die prematurely, then the house can be put up for sale. Uh, Still not a good idea because you might fall into an unlikely and uh, sort of Edmund and Lothians to fall into negative equity. But however, uh, it's unlikely. So usually the property can go up for sale. Although I still believe you should still have some sort of life cover. For you, whether you're single, you whether you have a partner, whether you're, um, you know, you have children, I still think it's a great idea to have life insurance to cover the mortgage debt. And what? Why is it a good idea to have life insurance? What does that kind of cover you for? Well, let's say for example you're a couple. Okay, what it will do is it will cover usually cover the mortgage debt. So basically, it's called decreasing life cover or decreasing term assurance or mortgage protection insurance that's the three names is given usually what it does is that if um one or the other um person if it's if it's a, a couple if it's joint if one or the other prematurely dies what will happen is the other person will receive the funds the outstanding uh, amount on the policy which usually covers the actual mortgage debt the, the full mortgage debt because it does decrease so what will happen is that the policy will fall in line with the actual mortgage so the mortgage starts off at 200 grand for example and maybe say after 10 years um it will drop to say maybe 140,000 150,000 and the policy should basically correlate with that figure so that should pay out and the other surviving um uh, individual the the partner will receive the funds to repay the mortgage that's what it does that's that's the objective of that policy okay perfect and there are some other types of insurances that you guys can help with as well um that might be in in addition to life insurance such as things like critical illness cover 
income protection. What are what are those, and, and why would somebody need those okay. additional yeah. insurances? Okay, so critical illness is is a, also a very very good product to have, um, and it's it, it's it's done in various ways. Okay, so some single people might not want to take out life insurance, but they will obviously want to try and at least look at critical illness. Now, critical illness is payable on diagnosis of a critical or serious illness. And I'll give you some examples of what that is. It's things like your organs, like the heart, the liver, um, your senses, um, d- things like dementia, motor neuron disease. Usually, insurance companies cover for up to about 40 critical illnesses. And there's an extra policy uh, that I've just been brought into play about sort of two or three years ago called enhanced serious illness, where it can cover up to 80 different serious illnesses. Um, and that, it works in exactly the same way as the life assurance. So what it does is that if one person or an individual person is diagnosed with one of these serious illnesses, um, remember, you're still alive. So basically that would pay out. Um, not right away because obviously it has to be, uh, it has to be assessed by the uh, claims department to make sure you've got that illness. You have to check with the GP, the consultant, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. Once that's all confirmed, then that would be payable to the either individual, uh, well, usually the individual, um, and again, that goes to repay the mortgage the same way as the life cover uh, is paid out. Now, if you're single, as I, as I alluded to earlier, some people don't want to take life cover. They only want critical illness on its own, standalone. But if you're a joint couple, usually it's a good idea to have what's called a joint life decreasing life cover with bolt on critical illness and it's a first event policy you claim on it once and then the policy finishes okay okay and there's various types of these there are, um there's what we call guaranteed premiums where the premium will never go up it will stay the same throughout the term of the of the, the actual policy itself or you can have something called reviewable premiums where it's usually after a period of five years the insurance company uh, have the right to increase the premiums depending on age okay. um usually um guaranteed pro, uh, premiums are normally the best option because you know you're not going to get any nasty shocks in five years um, so that's how critical illness works. Um, you mentioned income protection. That's a completely different kind of policy. Okay. That's based on your occupation. Okay. Now, you have to be careful with this because some employers actually offer what we call group income protection schemes. Now, um, I can't think of any employers off the top of my head, but there are a few that offer this. So if you have a group income protection scheme, you can not have a standalone income protection as well. Not normally anyway, because basically um, you're only allowed to uh, apply for a certain amount um, of cover, usually up to a 75% of your salary. Some insurers only offer 60%, but normally it's up to 75%. Now, this product, like critical illness and life cover, are both tax-free. One of the very few things in the UK that is tax-free, so the benefits and the proceeds will be paid tax-free. Going back to income protection again, if you don't have a group income protection scheme, employers will uh, usually pay you um, a sum not all employers pay a sum each month if you're ill. So some employers only play what we call statutory sick pay. Mm-hmm. Some have schemes where they'll pay you up to say six months on full pay, okay? Some, as I say, don't have any sick pay rules. I think this is getting less common nowadays. A lot of this, uh, the public sector schemes like um, civil service, university, NHS and the councils, they usually pay, if you've been there for a period of five years, you usually pay up to six months of full pay, then you, it drops to six months of half pay. And that's that's quite unique because a lot of employers don't have that. Mm-hmm. Now, with income protection, you've got to be very careful because, you again, if your employer pays you full pay for six months, you can't uh, start the, the benefit period on the income protection until after that period finishes because you can't have the employer paying you and the income protection paying out as well. So you've got to be careful with that. uh, 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 So a mortgage and insurance broker will always check with the the client to make sure they get that information from the client to say, how long does your employer pay you for and how much does he pay you for? So if it's six months of full pay, then the ideal scenario is to start the income protection after six months and it would kick in and you can have anything up to 75% of of um, of your salary. 
Okay. And so obviously the the reason you would get these is to protect, so you'd be still be able to pay your mortgage in the li- unlikely, or the, the situation where you became critically yeah, ill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the rationale behind this, and I appreciate that it depends on people's budgets, people's mm-hmm. costs, um, and I mean, an ideal world would be great for someone to have a couple, for example, to have a joint life, first event, life and critical illness policy to cover their mortgage and both to have income protections kicking in after the, the, their employer stops paying them or if they don't get any sick pay. And the reason for that, the reason there's, there's, there's room, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a case for all these policies combined together um, is because that you don't have a mortgage anymore because you've claimed on the critical illness, say, for example, Mm -hmm. yeah, but then say you work for an employer that doesn't pay you any salary at all, then the income protection would take the place of that salary. It won't take the place of it all, but you can tailor it. You can have what you want. You can have 25% of your salary, 50%, or even up to 75. And that's a good reason why you should always have these policies. But again, it depends on your budget. No, that's great. And so, Paul, if you're... If a first-time buyer is they're applying for their mortgage, they're mm-hmm. getting all their insurances in place, is that something that they've got to review annually or is it just when they move house or do they never have to think about <sighs> it again? Well, they, 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 they definitely, with income protection, you definitely want to review it at some point and that would depend if your salary goes up quite a lot, substantially. Yeah. You definitely want to review that. Or there's two reasons why you, you definitely want to review income protection. One, say you change occupation. For a start, okay, mm-hmm. that's a good way of doing it. And two, if you get a bigger salary, you definitely want to review it then, okay? Because um, you might go from a, I don't know, a, a deep sea diver to working in an office, then the quote's going to be cheaper. So you would want to re quote yeah. it and re broke it. Um, with uh, life insurance, life insurance, sorry, and critical illness, you definitely want to review that when you move house because it depends if you're upsizing or downsizing. Normally, I think the majority of people, if they're going to move house, they do, unless you're really old, maybe like me, then you want to downsize. But certainly when you're younger, you definitely want to upsize. So that's when a lot of these policies are quite flexible nowadays as well. The newer ones are where you can actually add cover onto it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and things like that. So they're pretty flexible. So you definitely want to review it then, no question. Perfect. Um, I think that's everything that I had I had um to ask you, Paul. Okay. Is there anything else you want to adv- give um, advice for any first time buyers? Uh, let me think. Um, not really. I mean, obviously, um, what you should also do as well is, and this is quite important, it's something we push here at ESPC Mortgages, is that you definitely need to see your solicitor to make a will, okay, 100% on that. That is really important. Whether you're a single person on your own, doesn't matter how old you are. Um, and also, um, and I, I'm not going to give any legal advice because I'm not legally trained to do this, but also uh, I know for a fact that Everybody should now do power of attorney as well. But that's something you should speak to your solicitor about because I'm not legally trained. No, that's perfect. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of ESPC's First Timers Club. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below uh, if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening along on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please give us an email at marketing at ESPC.com. Otherwise, I'll be back with the final episode of ESPC's First Timers Club next week. Bye!